Welcome to the annual Bess Truman Tea birthday celebration. My name is Susan Bowman, Region of the Independence Pioneers Chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. Since 1985, the Independence Pioneer Chapter has celebrated the birthday of Bess Truman on or near February the 13th. A member of our chapter, Jane Short Mallinson, started this event many years ago. We normally meet at the Truman Library. However, due to the current pandemic, we are doing so via a Zoom call. We are pleased that you are with us today. The Independence Pioneer Chapter, DAR, was organized on February the 26th 1914 in Independence and is a non-political, patriotic women's organization with three main goals, to support education, to promote patriotism, and preserve our country's history. We are delighted to partner with the Truman Library Museum and Institute today to honor First Lady Bess Truman. I would like to introduce some special guests. Linda Harden Sert, DAR National Parliamentarian. Catherine Grace Katz, author and speaker today. Kelly Anders, Deputy Director of the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum. The invocation today will be given by Julie Anderson, the Independence Pioneer Chaplain. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we gather before you in humble prayer before we start this visual celebration of our annual Best Truman birthday tea. We realize without your blessings, we would not be able to succeed with the plans for this activity. Bestow your grace and divine wisdom to all the planners, the facilitators, the presenters, and to all of us present here so that we may cooperate and enjoy the camaraderie and love for the greater glory of your name. Bless also those who are unable to join us this afternoon. May you grant them peace and happiness as they go about their activities. We ask your blessings upon us all, Lord, that we may enjoy peace and the goodness of your love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Susan, we're unable to hear you right now. Can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank, thank you. Elizabeth Virginia Wallace was born on February the 13th, 1885 in Independence, Missouri. Young Bess was beautiful, popular, strong-willed young woman who could, who could play a nifty third base and swim right uh, and ride as well as any boy. She first met Harry Truman in Sunday school when she was five and he was six. They shared elementary and high school classes. Upon graduation, Mr. Truman went to work on his grandfather's Young's farm in Grandview, Missouri, about 20 miles from Independence. Harry Truman began courting Bess in 1910, a courtship that lasted nine years. World War I postponed the wedding, but they were married on June 28, 1919. Their only child, Margaret, was born February the 17, 1924. In 1934, Truman was elected to the U.S. Senate 
And in 1944, he was selected as a candidate for vice president of the United States. Upon the death of President Roosevelt on April 12, 1945, Bess Truman became first lady when her husband became the 33rd president of the United States. An extremely private person, Mrs. Truman would spend much of her husband's presidency in Missouri, returning to Washington only for the social season. However, Bess was a full partner with her husband. She edited his speeches and put them in outline form. Harry would tell Bess to leave out those $2 words. Occasionally, Harry got over exuberant and laid down Bess's notes and, smoked and spoke in his own Missouri way. To Harry's supporters, his often exuberant and salty Missouri talk was right on the mark. In his off-the-cuff speeches, Harry connected with the working men and women because he'd been one of them. When Harry finished his speeches, Bess would gauge the reaction of the audience uh, of, to his message. In a sense, she was a one-woman Gallup poll. During her seven years and nine months as First Lady, Bess attended 200 teas, 112 luncheons, 140 receptions, and 30 state dinners. Bess managed her duties with grace and poise. Although she had a passion for anonymity, she was a very inf influential First Lady. She and President Truman returned to Independence and back to her grandfather's house at 219 Delaware Street. They returned to crowds welcoming them home. As they entered the house, Bess said to Harry, if this is what you get for all those years of hard work, I suppose it was worth it. Bess was a lovely wife, loving wife, mother, and proud grandmother. President Truman died on December 26, 1972. Bess passed away at her home on October the 18th, 18, 1982, at the age of 97, and is laid to rest beside her husband in the Truman Library Courtyard. Her gravestone inscription reads, First Lady, the United States of America, April 12, 1945, January 20th, 1953. Happy birthday, Bess. I would like to introduce Kelly Anders, Deputy Director of the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, and it's wonderful to be with all of you today on what would be Bess Wallace Truman's 136th birthday. Thank you to the Daughters of the American Revolution, Independence Pioneers Chapter, for being a loyal partner in presenting this program with the Truman Library each year, even virtually when we can't gather together in person. We are honored to host Katherine Katz as our featured speaker today, to discuss her recent book, The Daughters of Yalta. This is her first book and it has received incredible praise. The Daughters of Yalta was included on multiple best new books lists from Publishers Weekly, People's Magazine, and Town and Country, just to name a few. And it received glowing reviews from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Catherine took a non-traditional path to becoming a celebrated author. She graduated from Harvard University with a degree in history. Then she received a Master's of Philosophy in Modern European History from Christ's College at University of Cambridge. But she was working in finance in New York City when a visit to the bookstore in the lobby of her office in Manhattan led her to return to history and writing. As a result, we all have the opportunity to read this beautiful story about the intelligent and glamorous young women who accompanied their famous fathers to the Yalta Conference in February 1945. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Grace Katz. 
Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you everyone for taking the time out of your afternoon to uh, listen to this today. It is such a pleasure to join you and an honor to be here on Bess Truman's 136th birthday. I think it's especially poignant to uh, have this uh, conversation today because too often we forget the human side of our leaders in history and in presidents included. And while during you know, the tenure of a presidency, uh, the president is in some way is the, uh, you know, at the head of our national family, but they also have a family of their own. And we forget often that the words and actions of leaders are often the product of the thoughts and the ideas of so many people, uh, and not least their families, who are some of the most influential and important advisors in a presidency, albeit those who remain perhaps the most unsung. And just as your celebration today shines a light on the contributions and the role of the First Lady, in my work, I seek to shine a light on those who you know, leave few footprints in the historical record. Um, oftentimes, you know, these are people who are some of the most important in all of our lives. And we each have a person like this in our lives, one whose presence and guidance is invaluable. It's hard to define exactly what it is that they do that make them so important to us, but we know this person and their role when we see it. For many of us, this is someone in our own families. The story of the Yalta Conference set the stage for the world that the Trumans inherited, and what followed in its immediate aftermath sent a humble family from Independence, Missouri to the highest echelons of world power. And while the story that links the Roosevelt and Truman families is one that is well known, it's also worth remembering the lines between the, the Trumans and the Churchill family. Just three weeks from now, March 5th, marks the 75th anniversary of Churchill's speech, The Sinews of Peace, better known as the Iron Curtain speech, which he delivered in Fulton, Missouri, where he was joined by President Truman. To many historians, this joint appearance of the American president and the former British prime minister marks the beginning of the Cold War. But alongside the lofty history of geopolitics, there's also the story of families, a very personal story. Both Clementine and Winston Churchill and Harry and Bess Truman were the parents of daughters determined to make their own way. Daughters with talents and ambitions to, to share across the world stage. Margaret Truman, of course, is a classically trained soprano. She performed all over the country and later on television and radio. Sarah Churchill was an actress and dancer on stage and television and the movies. The height of her fame came in 1951 where she when she starred opposite Fred Astaire in the film Royal Wedding. But just before her starring turn, uh, she was also an actress in a touring production of A Philadelphia Story. And when the show came to Maryland, the Truman family came to see her perform and even visited her backstage. I wish I could have eavesdropped on this conversation between these two daughters who had so much in common. And as much as I would love to explore that story more, maybe dig into that a bit uh, more myself, I think perhaps now I should turn to the story you all came to hear, and that's the story of Sarah Churchill, Anna Roosevelt, and Kathleen Harriman, the daughters at Yalta. So I like to often start by looking at this photograph. This is one of the most famous photographs from the Second World War and of the big three, Churchill, FDR, and Stalin. So it was taken in the courtyard of Lavadia Palace in February 1945. You can see the three leaders with their military advisors behind them. The look on their face is grim. They look like they have the weight on the world on their shoulders. And this is not surprising in the least because uh, of the issues that they have come to discuss. It looks at this point uh, by the early spring of 1945 that the war in Europe will finally come to an end sometime later in the spring or by summer. The Battle of the Bulge has just ended. The brace is on to see who will be the first to liberate Berlin. And so the time has come where the three leaders must meet to discuss the plans for peace in post-war Europe. First on the table is the issue of what to do about Germany in the post-war period. Should Germany be allowed to remain one state or should it be broken up into smaller states? in hopes that, of deterring them from rising up in belligerence for a third time in a century. Also of great importance, especially to Winston Churchill, is the matter of Polish sovereignty. Britain went to war in defense of Pol Polish sovereignty at the outset, and the Polish government has been in exile in London ever since. He was determined that the thing that they went to war to defend will be guaranteed and secured at the end. Stalin, however, has other ideas. Poland is their neighbor through which the Soviet Union and before them, the Russian Empire has been invaded multiple times since the Napoleonic era. Stalin is determined that after all the sacrifices the Soviet Union has made in defense of the Allied cause, that they will not be left without some uh, uh, benefits to them in the end, namely securing, as he says, friendly neighbors on their borders. He wants to make sure that the government in Poland is going to be friendly to the interests of the Kremlin when this is all over. 
he can back this up by the fact that he has boots on the ground with the Red Army across Eastern Europe. So Churchill and Stalin are ready to dig in on this issue, which is of vital importance to both of them. FDR, meanwhile, has his attention somewhat more focused on the Pacific War. At this point in the war, the, uh, the Pacific War is not as advanced as the war in Europe. They don't yet know if the Manhattan Project will be a success. Um, so FDR is looking at the potential for a ground invasion of the Japanese home islands, which could potentially lead to the deaths of 200,000 American soldiers. It's imperative to save as many American lives as possible. And the way Roosevelt wants to do this is by bringing the Soviet Union into the war in the Pacific. Roosevelt thinks that he can make this, the Soviets break their pact of neutrality with the Japanese, which they've had since the beginning of the war, by offering Stalin territorial concessions in exchange for entering the war in the Pacific three months after the war in Europe ends. Roosevelt has another objective, and this one is a bit more personal. He's determined to succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed at the end of World War I with the League of Nations by creating a new international peace organization of United Nations. He wants to secure a legacy of peace. This will be his personal legacy to the world, not of an eternal peace. He knows that that is not a realistic goal, but at least peace in Europe for 50 years. This he thinks he can guarantee. But the organization that he envisions is also a way he believes to draw the Soviet Union into the international community after the war is over and the common enemy has been defeated. So he's determined to, to secure Soviet participation in this new organization. One of the other reasons though that they look so grim and exhausted is because of what it took to physically get to Yalta, which is something that I think people don't quite realize. At this point in the war, Stalin recognizes that he holds more cards than do his Western partners. And so he decides if they wanna meet in person, they're gonna to have to come all the way to the Soviet Union to meet with him. The farthest west he is willing to travel is the Crimea. He's terrified of leaving his security apparatus behind him. He's also afraid of flying. So determined to have this meeting in person, Churchill and Roosevelt agree to travel uh, thousands of miles and make a very dangerous trek. Churchill flies 1,300 miles first from London to Malta, where he'll rendezvous with Roosevelt. But on the way, tragically, uh, one of the planes in his group goes down off the coast of Italy and several members of the Foreign Office uh, expert delegation are killed. Meanwhile, Roosevelt has to make a week-long journey across the Atlantic Ocean by ship in a destroyer convoy where they're still sighting enemy U-boats. Then uh, they rendezvous at Malta, which has led to the apocryphal quip some of you may be familiar with, when Stalin said supposedly, I said Yalta, not Malta. So they meet there, and then they have to fly a further 1,400 miles over enemy-occupied territory, just still littered with enemy, enemy anti-aircraft units where their planes are being shot at at low altitude as they're flying to the Crimea, where they finally land in the Crimea on an airfield that is much too short for their airplanes. Then they have to drive a further six hours over battle-scarred roads, sometimes at no more than 20 miles an hour, till finally at the end of this long, long journey, they arrive at Lavadia Palace. Lavadia Palace is situated right on the Black Sea, and it was once the summer home of Tsar Nicholas II and his family, and it really was a family retreat away from the pressures of court. Here, the Tsar and his family would play tennis, go swimming, ride horses, visit the local bazaar. But after the Russian Revolution, the Soviets nationalized this once glamorous palace and turned it into a rest home for favored Soviet workers. And when the war broke out and the Nazis invaded the Crimea, the Nazis used Lavadia Palace as their Crimean headquarters. When the Soviets pushed them out several months before the Yalta Conference began, the Nazis stripped the palace of absolutely everything they could carry. The furniture, the art, the lamps, the dishes, literally down to the doorknobs, which they could melt down and use as scrap metal. So the Soviets have just three weeks from the time that the three leaders agree that this is where they'll have the meeting to turn this ransacked palace into a site fit for one of the most important meetings of the 20th century. What they do is they take the contents of glamorous hotels in Moscow, like the Hotel Metropole, which some of you may be familiar with if you read uh, Amor Toll's wonderful book, A Gentleman in Moscow. And they have to cart the contents of the hotels thousand miles south on trains to frantically restock the villa. The Soviets do what the Soviets do best, and they throw manpower at the situation, <laughs> for which they have no shortage, and they are able to succeed in this Herculean task, and they are very generous and gracious hosts. However, you know, even amidst all the glamour that they've been able to conjure almost overnight, it's very clear if you peek even just slightly behind the curtain that you can see, what you see on the surface, this lovely facade, is really not indicative of the conditions underneath. So you can see, again, a little bit more context for this photograph, you know, why it is that these, these leaders look so grim and frustrated just as peace is finally on the horizon. But what's very interesting about this photograph is that there's another photograph that is of the exact same scene, but shot from a slightly different angle. And you can see in this photograph are two young women. 
There are actually three young women uh, in the scene. One of them's just out of the focus of this camera, uh, but you can see her on the newsreel footage of the same uh, image. And you can see Sarah Churchill, Kathleen Harriman, and Anna Roosevelt, the daughters of Churchill, FDR, and Ambassador April Harriman. Sarah Churchill is 30 years old, Kathleen Harriman is 27, and Anna Roosevelt is 38. Looking at this picture, several questions sprang to mind. First was, of all the people that these leaders could have brought with them to serve as their aides at the Yalta Conference, why did they bring their daughters? What was so special about the relationships that they had with their daughters and these three daughters' skills and experience and abilities that made them the perfect partners to serve as their aides at one of these most important moments of, the, of 20th, the 20th century history on the precipice between World War and Cold War. But it also made me stop and think. We have you know, world leaders like presidents and prime ministers who we put on a pedestal to the extent that they become almost larger than life. But to someone, these people are just dad. And what would it be like for that person to be your father? Before I tell you a little bit more about them, I want to introduce you to someone else. Uh, this is me in third grade. <laughs> I think it was uh, pretty clear from an early age that I loved history. I grew up with my favorite movies being uh, The Sound of Music and White Christmas and The Great Escape. My grandfather was in World War II, he was in the Navy, and I used to chase him around at Thanksgiving with a pad of paper asking him to tell me his stories of growing up in Montana during the Great Depression and then college and joining the Army or joining the Navy. But I also was really fortunate to grow up in a, uh, an area where part of our education was this um, immersive experience in history. Uh, for us, like for you, I'm sure, uh, the pioneer experience is something that's very important to local history. And we had the opportunity in third grade to go and live like pioneers for a day. We got to have the experience of being pioneer school children where we dressed up and literally put ourselves in the shoes of the people who came before us. And this immersive experience of history of really imagining yourself in the shoes of someone in that era was something that really stayed with me. And I think it's something that has you know, continued to inform my work today. I think it came as a surprise to no one when I went off to college and became a history major. Uh, this is me, uh, my senior year at Harvard, the morning that I turned in my senior thesis. I was writing about uh, British prisoner of war escape narratives and their place in British culture and had 125 books checked out from the library, which my roommate thought was hilarious, so we had to take a picture. But this uh, experience of writing this thesis uh, allowed me to get to know Winston Churchill. I did not set out to write uh, a thesis about Churchill, but he had become very influential in a way that I didn't realize in this subject. He had written the first of what we think of as these escape narratives uh, in Britain when he wrote of the account of his escape from a Boer POW camp during the Boer War, where he was serving as a, he was a soldier and then a war reporter. And the story of his escape rocketed him to fame in Britain at just 24 years old and launched his political career. After Harvard, I went off to Cambridge in England, uh, and if you are a historically minded person, there's just about no better place to be fully immersed again in this environment of history where history is everywhere you turn. Got to work on my dissertation. I was writing about the origins of modern counterintelligence practices as they emerged during the First World War, and once again, I found myself spending a huge amount of time studying Winston Churchill. I did not anticipate this, uh, but I came to realize that Churchill, during his time as Home Secretary during the First World War, was one of the people who was responsible for a postal censorship initiative where they would open the mail uh, coming and going uh, uh, to and from foreign countries to try to root out enemy spies in their midst. And so Winston Churchill, again, highly involved in something I had no idea about. So after spending two years very, very in touch with the world of Winston Churchill, um, I decided that I should do what many recent grads feel is the smart thing to do. And I went to work in finance in New York City, traded in the idyllic pastoral Cambridge for the traffic and noise of Manhattan. However, this ended up being fortuitous in a way that I did not realize at the beginning because in the lobby of my office was a bookstore called Chartwell Booksellers, which was named for Winston Churchill's country home. This bookstore uh, specializes in, in books by and about Churchill. Uh, apparently it's the only one in the world that does. And I found myself needing you know, a break from the Excel modeling. I'd go down to the lobby and say I was going to get a coffee, but really I'd just be wandering into the bookstore over and over again. And uh, this was before The Crown came out. And so there, were, there weren't too many young women who were especially interested in this topic. Um, and so I think the owner was a bit amused that I was in there so frequently. I got to know him and over conversations, you know, shared what I had studied in school. And before long, he suggested that I should meet the International Churchill Society. 
Uh, the Churchill Society is made up of scholars and academics, but also you know, professionals in all different lines of works who want to encourage people to study history and foreign relations and go into public service and be modeled after uh, the, the legacy of Winston Churchill. But also involved in the Churchill Society is members of the Churchill family. And uh, around the time the owner suggested that I should meet them, they were having a, a dinner across the street from my office at the Waldorf Hotel in New York, where Madeleine Albright was the keynote speaker. And he suggested, you know, I should reach out and see if they could use any help. So I said, sure, I'd love to. Uh, so I contacted the, the director and he said, you know, come on over, uh, you, you will find this interesting. It's great to see uh, young people who are interested in history. And so off I went to this dinner where I was so fortunate to, to meet uh, members of the society, but also members of the Churchill family. And it was shortly thereafter that the Churchill family was opening the papers of Churchill's middle daughter, Sarah, to outside researchers for the first time. And the Churchill Society asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about them for their magazine. I said, yes, I would love to do this. Uh, I knew I didn't love my job in finance, and I thought I probably would apply to law school, but you know, it's just thought this would be a great way to stay engaged with history and writing. It also meant a chance to go back to Cambridge and see Sarah's papers uh, where they're housed uh, at the Churchill College Library. Um, but I also had a personal interest in Sarah Churchill, and this was uh, a completely coincidental uh, experience, but my family has gone to the cloister at Sea Island, Georgia every summer since I was a baby. And there on the wall of the lobby is a photograph of Sarah Churchill from 1949 on her wedding day. She had eloped to Sea Island with her second husband, Anthony Beecham. And I had admired this photograph since I was a little girl. You know, literally every summer since I was a baby, I saw this picture. Off I went to Cambridge to see Sarah's papers and was immediately struck by her life experience. As I mentioned, you know, people know her today. It's often in the context of having been an actress and starring in a movie with Fred Astaire. But I actually found the part of her life that was the most fascinating was her war years when she'd left this career as an actress that she had fought so hard to, to build for herself and set it all aside to do her bit for the war effort. Uh, Sarah joined the women's branch of the Royal Air Force where she was a reconnaissance uh, intelligence analyst where her job was to look at photographs that, was take, that were taken a thousand feet in the sky and make intelligence assessments. Uh, things like what kinds of ships were in enemy harbors based on the types of shadows that they cast and looking at fields to see where grass had been trampled and determine was it troop movement or was it just grazing cows. And she came to know some of the details of allied operations, especially in the Mediterranean, even better than her father, uh, of which he was very proud and also somewhat amused. Sarah and her father had a very close relationship since she was a little girl. And she said that she felt that she could understand the way that his mind worked. She uh, described it as walking in silent step with him. Or even if he wasn't speaking, she knew what he was thinking. And much of this was built through his experience that she'd had uh, being part of his favorite pastime, uh, one of his favorite pastimes, uh, which was bricklaying. And he would build uh, many uh, feet of bricks, brick walls in their garden at Chartwell, uh, their home in Kent. Sarah was his assistant, so they would spend many hours together outdoors laying bricks in this quiet contemplative harmony. Early in the war, the Churchill family had also decided that when Winston traveled abroad, they should, he should bring someone from the family with him as a supporter uh, and confidant of sorts, but also as an unofficial family historian. He wanted to write his war memoirs after the war as he had done after the First World War, and they wanted someone to, to be a family chronicler of sorts, to record the things that were taking place around the official meetings uh, to give a more holistic perspective of what had occurred. So Sarah you know, was the, really the perfect person to make the trip with him first when he went to, to Tehran in 1943 to meet with, with FDR and Stalin for the first time. It's this combination of skills that Sarah had where she was an actress, which lent itself so naturally to, diplo to diplomacy. She was a beautiful writer, uh, very much you know, the conscience of these events taking place and the way that she described things, really kind of echoing that lyrical gift for language that her father had. And she also had this intuitive understanding of what was taking place in the war with her, both her grasp of the political situation and her experience in the military. Once at Tehran, others took notice of how valuable she was to her father. Uh, two of these people, of course, were uh, FDR and the American ambassador to the Soviet Union, Avril Harriman. Avril Harriman had a very close relationship with his daughter, Kathleen, although it didn't necessarily start that way. 
Avril Harriman is someone who was one of the most important figures during the, the Cold War era and the World War II, but one who many people have forgotten today. Um, but just uh, as a reminder, he was one of the most, he was one of the wealthiest men uh, in America at the time of the Second World War. He's the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad, the founder of Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, he owned Newsweek Magazine, and he was also the founder of Sun Valley the glamorous ski resort, uh, which he'd created to encourage people to use his trains out, uh, and take them out west. He had two daughters, Mary and Kathleen. Kathleen was the younger of the two. And Aver really was not a close, you know, warm, fuzzy type of father. Um, he was very distant when his daughters were small. Uh, he and his wife had divorced when they were little. And it was only after uh, Kathleen's mother died when she was a teenager that she and her father began to build this relationship. And it was a relationship that was really founded on their shared love of sport and adventure. Kathleen was a phenomenal athlete. She was an Olympic level skier, a crack shot, an expert equestrian. And during her college vacations, uh, she had the opportunity to go and work with her father at Sun Valley. Avril Harriman was very ahead of his time in wanting his daughters to be involved in his work and his professional life to the extent that it interested them. And for Kathleen, uh, she was greatly interested. And so she built you know, the beginnings of this relationship with her father uh, through their shared time together in Sun Valley. When the war broke out, Harriman, who had joined the New Deal administration uh, in the 1930s at the urging of his sister, Mary Harriman Rumsey, who along with Frances Perkins was one of the foremost women in the New Deal administration, um, he had built this great friendship with Harry Hopkins, FDR's closest advisor. So when uh, FDR decided to enact the Lend-Lease program before the Americans entered the war. He sent Avril Harriman to London to become the Lend-Lease envoy. Uh, this meant working directly with the British government and Winston Churchill. Avril Harriman thought it would actually be a great idea to bring his daughter Kathleen with him. Kathleen was just 23, but he arranged for her to have a visa to work, come and work as a war reporter in Blitz-torn London. And so off she went at 23 into the, <laughs> the middle of the Blitz, where she spent the next few years at her father's side, first in London, uh, where they became very close friends with the Churchill family. So close, in fact, that they were celebrating Kathleen's 24th birthday on December 7th, 1941, when they all learned the news about Pearl Harbor. There was another connection between the Harrimans and the Churchills, which some of you may be familiar with, and this is through Pamela Churchill, Winston's daughter-in-law, who was married to his son Randolph. Uh, Kathleen and Pamela were best friends, but Kathleen realized that Pamela also had a particular bond to her father, and this was because they had become an affair. Uh, Pamela was two years younger than Kathleen, but, you know, in the middle of war, Stranger things had happened. And so Pamela and Avril Harriman had this romance uh, during the time that the, the Harriman spent in London. But in 1943, Avril Harriman was asked by FDR to become the ambassador to the Soviet Union. So he moved to Moscow, where Kathleen decided to go with him and learn Russian for both of them, so he wouldn't have time to do so. And she really became the American woman who had more access to and experience with Stalin in his inner circle than any other American woman in history. This photograph shows a picture of her with a horse that was given to her, her by Stalin uh, in recognition of the role that she had there. And when it came time for Yalta, Avril Harriman knew that his daughter would be the perfect person to come with him and act as a liaison between the Soviets and the Americans in the, uh, in the creation of this conference. She could speak Russian. She was familiar with everybody across all three delegations uh, from her time in London, Moscow, and being an American, of course. And she really was able to expand her father's reach and influence on the ground. Finally, the third daughter is Anna Roosevelt. At 38, she was the, the oldest of the three daughters, and she was also the only mother. Uh, at this time, she had three children, the oldest of which was 18 years old. And Anna, she uh, had a very, very close relationship with her father when she was a little girl, really shared through this, um, this mutual love of nature and the environment. And she dreamed that someday when she grew up that she and her father become the co-custodians of sorts of their home in the Hudson River Valley. But all of this changed when her father was diagnosed with polio. And all of a sudden, this close bond that she had with her dad was gone in an instant. And suddenly she was pushed aside in favor of all the doctors and nurses who had to attend to him and his political colleagues who now had to come to him. Anna was sent away to school, which she resented. And she felt that there was you know, a, a double standard that you know, here was some of the, the most progressive you know, figures in American politics at the time. And yet they expected her to go off uh, to school and to you know, be you know, a debutante. Uh, in a traditional way. And so she made a very rebellious marriage at age 20. Uh, unfortunately, the marriage didn't last. 
but she then fell in love again uh, on the campaign trail with her father as he was campaigning for president for the first time. And she fell in love with a Republican journalist named John Bodiger. Uh, Bodiger worked for William Randolph Hearst, who was one of FDR's chief critics, but they put their political differences aside and fell deeply in love. They got married and they moved to Seattle where they became the editors of one of Hearst's papers, Seattle Post Intelligencer. When the war broke out, uh, her husband decided to join the military. He joined the army in 1943 and was soon sent to the Mediterranean. And Anna decided around Christmas 1943 that she didn't want to stay in Seattle by herself, that she'd prefer to move home and back east and be with her family. And home meant moving to the White House. So Anna arrived uh, at Christmas and began to notice something wasn't quite right about her father. He was not as quick to grasp things as he used to be. He'd sit there with his mouth hanging open for long periods of time, almost like he couldn't get enough oxygen. And she was very alarmed, uh, but nobody else quite seemed to notice that something had changed about him, including her mother, Eleanor. That spring, Anna decided that she was going to insist that he have a comprehensive medical examination. Uh, finally agreed. And in March 1944, it was uh, discovered that FDR was dying of congestive heart failure, of which there was no cure. Anna and the doctor were sworn to secrecy, and Anna took it upon herself to try to save her father to the extent that it was possible uh, to you know, make changes to his diet, to encourage him to rest as much as you could encourage a wartime president to rest. She also became very much a gatekeeper in the White House, helping to determine who really needed an audience with the president and who could meet with someone else. Sometimes she even went so far as to take papers out of his inbox at night and distribute them to others who she felt could handle them so he wouldn't need to be bothered. But throughout all of this, FDR never once asked what was wrong with him. He didn't want to know if there was something wrong, it'd be too big of a distraction, so he just set it out of his mind. But he realized that Anna was doing something very important. Anna had long wanted to accompany him on one of his overseas voyages during the war, but FDR had always turned to his sons in the past, largely to help him stand physically and to, to help him to assist him you know, with the, the more physical aspects of you know, needing to move and stand. And um, this is something that they were you know, well suited to handle. And he'd always kind of held Anna at arm's length. But now realizing that something you know, maybe wasn't quite right and she was doing something to protect him, he cabled his friend Winston Churchill in January 1945 and said, if you're thinking of bringing your daughter Sarah to this conference again, I'm thinking of bringing my daughter Anna. So Anna finally has her chance after years of hoping to join her father and to recapture the closeness that she remembered with him uh, from the time she was a little girl. But she knows that even though she you know, finally has you know, succeeded and fulfilled this lifelong dream, that it's likely going to be short-lived and it's very possible this may be her last chance to ever be with him in this way again. So Anna uh, goes off to Yalta. She, uh, as I mentioned, they travel by uh, ship for a week, which is this lovely time for father and daughter to, to spend some quiet time together before the real uh, events begin. This is a picture of the three daughters together at the Yalta conference. You can see Sarah in her military uniform, Anna in a tweed uh, in the middle and Kathleen in this lovely fur coat. And it's really interesting to think about the unique role that they played at Yalta. I think of them as daughter diplomats, where they're there in a quasi-official capacity, which is different from somebody uh, like somebody from the State Department or the British Foreign Office, where you're really there in a very official capacity where you speak on behalf of your government. They're not necessarily speaking on behalf of the government, but they do speak with the weight of their fathers behind them. So they're able to go places and do things and have subtle conversation, de deliver nuanced messages, that other people might not be able to do. They're also able to go out into the local community and meet some of the people whose lives are being reordered by the conversations taking place across the conference table. Then they then come back and they report back to their fathers what they saw, uh, which is in, in some cases very moving. For each of their daughters, the, the role is a little bit different. For Sarah Churchill, she's very much the, the counselor and conscience almost, as I mentioned, to her father throughout the duration of the conference. For she has this astute grasp of politics and the actual developments of the war. And she's really able through this emotional and intellectual bond she has with him to help him shape his frustrations, uh, which you know, he has great frustrations at this time in the war, especially as he feels that FDR is not as close to the Brits as he once was. And Sarah is able to help him you know, shape those thoughts into the most positive line of argument. So he can go uh, and put his best foot forward in the conference room with Stalin the next day. As I mentioned, Kathleen Harriman, she speaks Russian, and so she is very useful, you know, as a, an envoy on the ground. 
But she's also, you know, I think of like what we think of today as a protocol officer of the State Department of sorts. And she's also, you know, she's handling the logistics, working with the Soviets, but she's also able to expand her father's influence. You know, as the ambassador, he's very important, not as important as the prime minister or the president, but he, as, as of late, has begun to have a, a difference of opinion with FDR, where he's much more skeptical of the Soviets than is the president. He is uh, more similarly minded to Churchill at this time, who has growing concern about how much Stalin can be trusted. Anna Roosevelt, uh, she's really the, the keeper of her father's secrets at this conference. You know, first, of course, the secret of his health, which she can tell no one. Some of the members of the, the conference delegation can very frustrated with her because she they're trying to meet with the president. She's trying to hold him at arm's length and she can't tell anyone why. Uh, she's also holding uh, a few of his other secrets, uh, which maybe I, I won't reveal here, but hopefully you'll read the book and find out about those as well. Um, meanwhile, you know, she's carrying this terrible emotional burden and knowing that, you know, as I said, she, you know, this may be the last chance that she has to be with her father. But what shares, but unites all three daughters is that it's this final chance for the three of them. While they, the war has given them opportunities, like so many women, to use the skills and abilities that they had in ways that may have gone unrecognized, to be able to participate to the extent that they know that they can contribute, but also to be that person who is of greatest importance to their fathers in the most pressing and urgent times. So uh, these three daughters, while they're you know coming to Yalta, we have different perspectives, different things to contribute, they really do share this, this one moment. And they know that they're living through a remarkable time in history. They're very aware of this. And part of the reason they wrote about it so much, and we as historians have the opportunity to learn their thoughts and opinions today, is because they wanted to record what they knew would be a fundamentally important moment in history. So I also like, you know, just like to close by uh, offering a few thoughts on what the experience of these three daughters who attended the Yalta conference can tell us about our world today. And first is uh, a little bit of, you know, thinking about the context of the American relationship with Russia, specifically the relationship between the president and the Russian leader. FDR was determined to build a, a personal bond of sorts with Stalin. He had this really close friendship with Churchill, that their friendship was really the bedrock of the special relationship. And FDR is determined to build the same sort of friendship and relationship with Stalin. Through Anna's eyes, you can see just how determined he is to do this and the frustrations when it doesn't quite work out as well as he had hoped. I think this is something that's really important to keep in mind, especially we're at the beginning of a new presidential administration, where you know, this attempt to build this friendship with the Russian leader and to have this personal line of communication is not necessarily as always a successful strategy. Uh, Truman was certainly much more skeptical about the Soviets than was FDR, um, but you've seen later American administrations like the Bush administration, Obama administration, and Trump administration tried to build, again, this personal relationship with Putin, which was no more successful now as it was 75 years ago. I also think it's really important to think about you know, the role of the family in, the, in a presidency. We have you know, long ago accepted that we do want to have some defined role for a first spouse in a presidential administration, but what is the appropriate role for the uh, unelected adult children to play in a presidency? Um, you know, this is something we haven't had to think about until recently because pri you know, prior administrations had had very young children in the White House, but now I think this is something that's much more part of the, the public conversation. To some extent, it's kind of like when you marry someone, you marry their family. When you elect someone, you do somewhat, you know, elect their family in a way. But what is the, the right role? What's the right balance for, you know, to have, you know, a family play? Of course, you want them to be there, to, to be the confidants and the people that you can trust above all others in some of the most difficult moments. But, you know, when does it go too far? And so these are questions that I think that we should talk about in our, our conversations, you know, in the world at this moment. And finally, through this pandemic, uh, we do have the opportunity to talk to each other like we do today with technology, which is wonderful. But I also think it's really important to remember how important it was to Churchill and Roosevelt that they meet in person with Stalin, that there are some elements of diplomacy that must be handled in person. And so when the pandemic is over, I hope that we can return as quickly, especially in diplomacy and foreign policy, to having these meetings in person because there's just something very important about actually physically going to someone's country and learning their culture and meeting with them uh, in a one-on-one -on -one basis as you know, in this human connection, which I think is really the bedrock of so much uh, of foreign policy. So those are just a, th a few thoughts uh, about what Yalta and these daughters experience can tell us about the world today. Uh, and now I'd love to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'd love to take your questions. And uh, I don't, can you hear me? 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can do so via the chat feature. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat for her and uh, she can answer those from there. Yes. Um, so I see two questions have already come up in the Q&A. Um, the first question um, is, uh, Frank asks, were these the only women at the conference? Um, they were the only women kind of with this more explicit role at the conference. They were the, in the British delegation, there were uh, a few other women who were there overseeing some logistical things like Joan Bright Astley, who uh, she was kind of the, the logistical point person for the British. And there were a few um, female typists and secretaries who were there. But these were the only women who were actually interacting with the principals on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so they are you know, certainly the only women that have kind of this meaningful role in the way that we think of kind of the actual goings on of the policy discussions, you know, not in the conference room, but with the key leaders. Um, and so uh, there were a few other women there, but not in an outward facing role. Would you like me to field the questions myself, or do you want to pose the questions and then I can answer I them? I tell you, I cannot, I can't see them. I don't see them. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy sorry. to ask you the question, Catherine. Okay. Sure. So Patrick asks, what are mm -hmm. the best primary sources for the daughter's role at Yelp? Yes, uh, great question. Um, as a historian, I love sources. I love going into archives. It really is like a treasure hunt. And as I mentioned, I was one of the first people to be able to see Sarah Churchill's papers when they were opened at uh, Churchill College at Cambridge. She wrote letters to her mother throughout the conference. I also had the chance to see Kathleen Harriman's papers, uh, a few of which are in her father's archive at the uh, National Archives, uh, or sorry, the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, but most are just in a private you know, collection that the family still has. She only passed away in 2011, and it was only after she died that her family discovered her scrapbooks from her time living on the forefront of history as a young woman coming of age during the war, both in London and Moscow. So her letters that she wrote to Pamela Churchill, to her sister Mary, to her former governess, uh, those are incredible reflections on life uh, around her throughout the entire war and specifically at Yalta. Anna Roosevelt's papers are at her, uh, the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park. She wrote letters to her husband and to her mother. Um, when she moved into the White House, she had made an agreement with her father that she would not keep a diary so that everything that was you know, discussed would remain secret. She had no interest in writing a tell-all memoir like some people did after the war. Um, but she decided to uh, break her own rule for the duration of the conference and keep a little diary, largely so she could sh share the experiences of the day to day with her husband when she returned home and with her children. And so we do have a little mini diary uh, from Anna, which is at the FDR Library of Hyde Park. But I was also really fortunate to be able to talk to some people who knew these daughters at that time and people who you know loved them and knew them better than anyone. One of these people was Anna Roosevelt's daughter, Ellie who was 18 at the time of Yalta. She was very kind to share her memories with me. Um, I also got to talk to Winston Churchill's secretary, Lady Jane Williams, uh, who's also the mother of the Archbishop of Canterbury. So she's had a fascinating life and a really front row seat to history. So it's this perfect inflection point of where new papers that were not discovered before suddenly now are available. But we also have people with us today who remembered the times uh, as you know, they were, the events as they were taking place and you know, people who knew and loved these, these women more than anyone. Excellent. Our next question comes from Jane, and I'm going to combine a couple of questions, actually. Jane, Ellen, and William are asking, where did the daughters' lives go after Yalta, and did they continue a relationship after the conference? Yeah, so it's really tempting to think of the kind of these three daughters, you know, they go into the conference, kind of like three girls against the world, or these only women who are in this position. Um, Sarah Churchill and Kathleen Harriman knew each other before arriving at Yalta, and they were friendly. The Churchills and Harrimans, the, the two families were very good friends, um, but neither of them had met Anna Roosevelt. She had not, you know, traveled to any of these, you know, conferences abroad, and I think that she felt a, a little bit um, sometimes unsure of herself and not having the confidence that the other two daughters had, and so there's a little bit of tension at times sometimes between Anna and Kathleen, where Anna was kind of the ranking daughter as the president's daughter, but everybody knows and is familiar with Kathleen already. And so there's a, a little tension between them sometimes, which is really interesting. But I think that the relationship, it really ebbs and flows with the relationship among their fathers, kind of mirroring in the relationship with the daughters. And uh, even though they do have many, uh, they, are, they are friendly, um, they have you know, this shared experience. First and foremost, their loyalty is to their dad and to their country. So it doesn't always line up perfectly uh, with the lines of friendship. 
which is interesting. Um, after the war, I, I, mean, I don't want to give away too much if anybody hasn't read the book yet. Um, I, they don't walk away from the altar the best of friends, but they do value the shared experience that they had had. And their lives continue to intersect each other uh, in different ways throughout the next few decades. And um, each of them, they experience things that are very similar um, coming from some of the uh, so what we know today about you know the trauma of war and mental health and you know thank god we've come so far today in understanding that better than we did then but each of their lives were affected by you know the experiences that their loved ones had had fighting in the war and they were able to derive some comfort and solace knowing that the other daughters were experiencing something similar um so i i, I think that's a i don't again i don't want to give away too much um but they do continue to echo each other and reunite in unique ways over the next few decades. Excellent. We've got a couple of questions about Stalin's daughter. So Sam asked, did Stalin's daughter have any role at the Alta content conference? And Richard asked, did Stalin know the daughters were coming and why didn't he bring his daughter who later defected? Yes. Uh, great question about Stalin's daughter. He does have a daughter, Svetlana. She is 19 at the time of Yalta, and she's married and pregnant with her first child. Um, and she did speak English, so she could have been really valuable to her father, much like the other daughters were. However, Stalin does not like his daughter to interact with foreigners. Um, the only time that Winston Churchill ever met Svetlana was in 1943, when he went over to meet with Stalin in Moscow. And at that time, Stalin brought Svetlana out at dinner, almost as if kind of this, like a prop in a way, as if to show off and you know, saying like, look, I'm a family man too, which is very odd. And Churchill later wrote about this. Uh, so Svetlana is not at the conference, but she and her dad also have a really tense relationship at this time, because when she was a teenager, she discovered that her mother had committed suicide. It was really driven to it by Stalin's cruelty. And she held her father responsible, and I think rightly so. She rebels and falls in love with a, uh, a married uh, Soviet uh, filmmaker uh, who is Jewish. Um, and Stalin is uh, very offended by this. And so he sends this man uh, to Siberia. Svetlana then rebels again and falls in love with her classmate, Grigory Morozov, who's also Jewish. Stalin again takes exception to this and he refuses to ever meet his son-in-law. And so that's kind of this, the point of the relationship uh, in 1945. Svetlana did defect after Stalin died, she came to the United States. There's actually a great novel that came out about this last year uh, by John Burnham Schwartz called The Red Daughter, which I highly recommend if it's of interest. Um, but Svetlana, a very tumultuous life, and how could it not be, you know, being Stalin's daughter? But it is really interesting. She does kind of make a brief appearance in spirit at Yalta because she had sent Sarah Churchill a brooch, kind of in this daughter-to-daughter -daughter diplomacy earlier in the war. They were both redheads, and so you know, maybe Svetlana felt a, a special connection to Sarah Churchill. Um, and Sarah wears the brooch that Svetlana gave her on her uniform throughout the conference uh, as this kind of diplomatic gesture uh, on a daughter-to-daughter -daughter level, which I think is really nice. Excellent. We've got time for a few more questions here. Um, I'll ask this one from Frank first. Are you working on another history book? Uh, yes. Um, so I am eager to really uh, get underway with the next book. I'm also still in law school. Um, I'm a, a second year student at Harvard Law, so I have two more years I got to finish. <laughs> so I got to figure out how to balance that with uh, writing another book. Um, I am looking at something right now that is taking place um, in the 1930s. Um, kind of, I love these slice of time sorts of stories where you see multiple strands of history intersecting in one moment with unique figures kind of all brought together because of this event. Um, so kind of in that spirit. Um, the really frustrating thing right now is that none of the archives are open. I cannot get any primary sources in you know, Washington, New York, London, everything is closed because of COVID. So it's kind of delaying things a bit. So as much as I would really love to get cracking on the next one, uh, I have to kind of bide my time and wait for those to reopen, which is a frustration shared by historians everywhere right now. And I'll take this moment to remind everybody that The Daughters of Yalta is available for purchase now. Rainy Day Books does carry it, and it will be available at the Truman Library Bookstore when the library reopens. Um, but we'll end on a Truman question here. Did President Truman talk to Anna Roosevelt after FDR died and when Truman traveled to Potsdam? That's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that the Truman family was very... Um, sensitive to and courteous towards the Roosevelt family after FDR died. FDR dies April 12th, just eight weeks after the Yalta conference ends. And just in an instant, Anna's life changes. 
her father had been president throughout most of her adult life. And all of a sudden now it's like her home has been ripped away from her. You know, not only the White House, you know, her father's no longer the president anymore, but also their home in Hyde Park, uh, which he had left to the government for the uh, FDR presidential library. And so, you know, things are just, you know, suddenly everything that you know is gone. And so I do know that Harry Truman was very conscious of this and really wanted the Roosevelts to take their time um, and feel that the White House was still their home. Um, I think Eleanor, you know, she wanted to, to move on quickly, but as far as I know about kind of the transition from one to the other, um, I don't know necessarily about him having a conversation with Anna uh, before Potsdam, but I, that's the, the little bit that I know about Truman's interaction with the other family members. Uh, at that time. Um, although Mary Churchill, uh, Winston Churchill's other daughter was at Postum. And so I'd be very curious to see uh, any conversations between Mary and Harry Truman there. All right, we'll turn it back over to Susan. Thanks everyone for the great questions. Okay. I just want uh, Catherine to know I bought her book and, and I got it right off Amazon. So, um, there's probably lots of places you can buy it. Uh, Catherine oh, Grace. Amazon or the, your favorite local bookstore. <laughs> uh, yeah, or your local bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're still open. <laughs> Catherine Grace, the Daughters of the American Revolution celebrates women in American history. And March, we celebrate as History Month. It emphasizes women in American history and the role of women, past and present. I read a review of your book online and it said, You're, you bring history to life. And I'm sure that that's so, so, so true. The Independence Pioneer Chapter, NSDAR, would like to present to you the Women in American History Award that comes with a lovely certificate and medal. And thank you for your book, The Daughters of Yalta. So here's your, whoops, here you go. Oh, thank you we so will, much. We I'm promise so to, to mail that to you so that you can have that for, you know, whatever you'd like to use it for. But we're thrilled uh, to be able to present that to you today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you do, everything that the Daughters of American Revolution does across the country and also the Truman Library. And the history is so important and it's it it in different ways and different moments. And even yes. the history that we think we know so well, I think it's worth returning to time and again both because we, you know, new sources are revealed that gives us a different perspective, but there are also different lessons to draw and different inspiration to draw in different times and things that may not have stood out to us at one moment suddenly do in a completely different way. So thank you both to both organizations oh. for everything that you do to, to promote history and its place in public discussion and especially supporting women uh, and their role in history. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, um, I will just close and say thank you to each of you for being with us on this. Well, I'm assuming it's cold where you're at. It's very, very cold here uh, for the celebration of the birthday of Bess Truman. I hope that this is a one of a kind event and maybe next year uh, we will be all squared away to uh, enjoy that at the, the new renovated library. So thank you all so much. Stay safe.